So, uh, PowerShell 6, a living roadmap. So uh, we're gonna be talking today about uh, what we're doing on GitHub, what's going on with the next version of PowerShell. Uh, as you all know, we got all this cross-platform goodness going on, so, so let's dive right in. Uh, oh, and I'm, I'm Joey, I'm a, I'm a program manager at Microsoft. Uh, I work on the PowerShell team and I uh, primarily uh, own our open source and cross-platform efforts. So, uh, PowerShell additions. Uh, this is a question that's come up. We want to get really crisp and clear about the terminology. We have two kinds of PowerShell now. We've got Windows PowerShell. Windows PowerShell is differentiated by one factor, and that is that it uses the .NET full CLR. So, uh, by its nature, it can only then run on Windows, right? So, .NET Framework, the full thing, only runs on Windows uh, and Windows Server. Uh, and today we have versions of this ranging from 1.0 to 5.1. This is the PowerShell that you're all familiar with and that you've used for, for almost a decade. Uh, PowerShell Core is differentiated only by the fact that it runs the core CLR. So .NET Core is the open source cross-platform uh, version of .NET. Uh, and, and we basically refactored everything to run on, uh, on top of these APIs. Today .NET Core is at 1.1. We're switching over to .NET Core 2.0, something I'll be talking about. Uh, in great detail later. Um, there is one version of PowerShell Core that will never ship on uh, Mac or Linux, and that is 5.1. Uh, 5.1 shipped inside of NanoServer, uh, and, and we might get to talking a little bit later about uh, how NanoServer will, will move to 6.0 at some point. But today, the code base that we have on GitHub that runs on Windows, Mac, and Linux is 6.0. So we're all good on that front. And by the way, if anybody has any questions anytime, you feel free to raise your hand and interrupt me. It's all good. We'll, we'll speed it up as we go here. So, we had three goals with PowerShell 6 uh, when, when we set out on this project. The first one was ubiquity. So, we wanted to build for all the platforms that are out there. We recognize that the world is a heterogeneous world. How many of you guys manage some Linux servers at some point in your day? Right, awesome. Uh, how many of you have a MacBook? Yeah, okay. So, you know, people care about other platforms. Windows is not the whole world. And, and we recognize this, and so we needed to get PowerShell everywhere. So in practice, what does this mean? This means we support all the major versions of Linux that we can, uh, all the major distributions, Mac OS. Um, it means that we wanted to enable you guys, the script authors and module authors, to write fully portable universal scripts and modules that work uh, cross-platform and also cross-CLR. So it's important that these work both in Windows PowerShell and in, in Core PowerShell. And it also means that we wanted to make sure that the new systems could talk to the old systems and vice versa. So this means you know, for, for instance, that we have bi-directional remoting uh, using both WS MAN protocols and SSH protocols. So we're trying to bridge the new and the old, uh, you know, the, the windows and the non-windows um, and, and really be, be sort of the connector uh, uh, of the cloud and of, of the modern world, as Jeffrey says. So dovetail right there. Another goal with PowerShell 6 was to enable cloud scenarios. So, uh, you know, the world is moving to the public cloud, Azure, REST APIs, many of these REST APIs are documented with Swagger and Open API, which is something that, that we're, we're going to enable uh, commandlet generation out of, um, and other public clouds. As you all know, AWS, VMware, Google, all these guys have PowerShell core commandlets at this point that run on Mac and Linux. Um, and so, uh, you know, we, we wanted to make some major improvements to invoke REST method, invoke web request, convert from JSON. These are commandlets that have all been very useful in the past. Um, but, you know, there's a long tail of bugs out there that we needed to close out and make sure that, that we really had rock-solid JSON and REST commandlets. Um, it also means that we're working with the Azure PowerShell team to support PowerShell Core. So uh, they they're currently have a, a sort of, I wouldn't say a proof of concept, but a very limited set of modules uh, that are available in the gallery that work with Core. Um, and we're working with them to, to get a lot more of those ported over. And again, uh, you know, we're working closely with VMware and, and AWS to, to support PowerShell Core. Third goal was community. So this was uh, this is the one that really really brings you guys into the loop here, um, and and I think primarily it meant going open source. So uh, you know we wanted everyone to be able to contribute directly into the product. Um, we wanted not just your code but your input to really be part of this this very tight feedback loop that allows for uh, you know basically you you to to file a bug and then for uh, for for that bug to get fixed. Uh, within uh, days, hours, or even minutes uh, with a release coming down the pipeline. You know, not every six months or, or 12 months like a WMF would come out, um, but, but every, every three weeks is currently our release cadence. Um, 
It also meant that we, we have uh, a lot of transparency. I'm just going to kind of fill this slide up. Um, you know, we're, we're doing everything out in the open. Our project planning happens on GitHub. You know, when I uh, uh, talk to engineers, uh, you know, they'll send me an email. I said, you know, this email doesn't need to be an email, you know, file an issue, right? We can talk about this on GitHub uh, unless we have a really, really, really good reason to keep something secret, which I really don't have one yet. Uh, you know, we, we just put it on GitHub. And so you see our milestones, our project planning, um, all the pull requests, uh, everything is out there. And, and you'll see us sort of dynamically reprioritizing um, based on the issues that you guys file. So, you know, I might think that uh, REST and JSON are a priority today, um, but if tomorrow I get a bunch of remoting issues, it becomes clear to me that remoting is an issue uh, or, or a priority for, for you in the community. And so, uh, you know, we, we sort of bump those into the milestone and, and reprioritize that way. Uh, we also do PowerShell core community calls. This is something uh, I think we've had four now. Um, basically, uh, uh, any of you guys join the DSC resource community call? Yeah, so this is, this is very similar. Uh, this happens on Skype. Um, we do this the third Thursday of every month now, and, and you basically can hop on uh, with the PowerShell community of which, or the PowerShell committee, excuse me, of which I'm a member, um, and we talk about you know, what we've been doing for the last month and, and where we're at, and really get a lot of input for you to, to make sure that, that we're doing the right thing. All right, so sounds great. How do, how do we get there, right? We were in Windows. How did we get to the point where we, we could uh, you know, start to fulfill all of these goals? So before this, uh, you know, we didn't have the best engineering systems in the world. We didn't have a lot of agility, velocity. Uh, I know there's a lot of frustration, or there was a lot of frustration out in the community around, you know, I've got this stupid bug. I filed it nine months ago. The PowerShell team knows about it. It should be like a one-line fix in the code base. You know, what's going on, right? And this was really due to, uh, you know, the legacy source control, engineering systems, testing systems that we had. We had a very painful manual release process. The, the tooling, I was talking to some people last night, to, to build a WMF is extremely, uh, you know, uh, unwieldy. Um, and so that's why, you know, you, you saw this time lag all the time between when we said, oh, we've got the fix internally, and then, you know, getting it to your hands was, was difficult. Um, we also had a lack of visibility. So code reviews were happening, you know, in, in private email chains. Um, issues and work items were stored in multiple places. Uh, you know, this happened with, with the sort of community feedback as well. We had Connect and User Voice in the TechNet forums, and, you know, that meant that I had to essentially triage these things in and and uh, you know, copy a work item from Connect over to, uh, to our TFS internally. And, and, and this was really uh, disconnected the engineers from the feedback loop, right? They didn't understand why a lot of these bugs were coming in or what the scenarios were that you guys uh, you know, were, were doing in order to, uh, they, they, why you needed these bug fix. So you know, I, I say that we had, we had the PowerShell monolith, right? This was uh, for those 2001 fans out there. Um, you know, we, we just had this giant, bulky, uh, you know, unwieldy thing that, that nobody really understood or, or that you couldn't see into. It's a big black box. What's that? This was uh, 2001 A Space Odyssey. So this was the, uh, the aliens that come down and talk to the apes in that one for, uh, for you sci-fi fans. So what we needed is what most of you needed, right? Uh, you, you need better engineering processes, and that meant you know, rapid independent builds, transparent uh, test systems that, that are really fast, um, and automated packaging for every platform. So you know, today, every single pull request, and uh, uh, pull request and commit that goes into GitHub, uh, all these things happen out in the open. We've got AppVayer and Travis CI, and all the tests run, and the packages build, and life is beautiful. We also needed better collaboration, so we needed uh, you know better visibility for you guys, uh, and, and even for our own internal teams. You know now I can I can point internal partners to GitHub and just say it's it's all out in the open. This is what we're working on. Um, this has made it really easy. You know we follow .NET Core's example here. I, I rarely had to actually go talk to the .NET Core team. I could just pull up their GitHub and see oh this is coming in the next uh, the next milestone, and and uh, you know that's going to be great. We also needed a, a clear uh, system of governance. So. When we make changes to PowerShell, you know, you guys, in, instead of sort of uh, implementing this thing in a WMF and throwing it out there and seeing how everybody likes it and then, you know, coming back and making code changes, we can now just state out in the open, hey, this is the one month review period for this, this language change and, you know, is this the right thing and, and should we even go about implementing this? And so we really are getting these, these very tight feedback loops now. But why open source? 
right? All of this could have been accomplished without giving you the source code, right? We, we could have opened a GitHub and, and done our project planning there and, and all that. Well, first, that I, the thing I just love is the fixes from the community, right? We've got a ton of these. There are people in this room, uh, you know, too numerous to count, I think, that, that have already made small fixes into PowerShell um, and large fixes into PowerShell. Uh, you know, within one day, we had a, somebody implement a Docker container. Within a couple weeks, someone had stood up a, an app image uh, uh, package. We have Arch Linux support. This is something that wouldn't have been a priority for us otherwise. Uh, you know, new parameters to commandlets, bug fixes for long tail commandlets, spelling and grammar fixes in our docs. Um, all awesome stuff. Uh, we also have education by the community. So as we've sort of trained community members to understand how our processes work, uh, more and more of them uh, sort of become our advocates and really become part of the project. Uh, you know, we have one contributor in particular, uh, Ilya Sasanov, who's a PowerShell MVP, and within three or four weeks of the project going live, he had started using the royal we. So he would say, you know, we need you to, uh, to, to add some tests to this pull request before we can accept it, um, which as somebody that we'd never met before uh, was awesome. Because he was right, he, we, we did need uh, tests and, uh, before we could accept that pull request. And so this is just sort of something that, that really gives us a little bit more time uh, to devote to, to the core engineering efforts in PowerShell. Um, it also gives you visibility into team priorities. You, know, you, you literally can see this is where engineers are spending their time. This is when you say, I don't understand why this bug isn't getting fixed. You say, well, you know, this is the, the 50 other things that we did instead of fixing that bug. And it becomes very clear that, you know, oh, OK, yeah, those are, those are a lot of important uh, fixes or, or enhancements. And, and you know, maybe, maybe my bug uh, you know, can, can wait until the next milestone. It's also totally required to gain credibility from the Linux community. So as part of going cross-platform, this is something we just absolutely had to do. Linux admins do not run closed source binaries on their box, by and large. Um, and so, so, you know, open source was, was the way to go. Do any of you run closed source binaries on Linux servers? NVIDIA drivers. Oh, no. NVIDIA drivers, yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's a good one. Um, so we've done this before, right? What's the big deal? We, we've done the resource kit, the docs, the editor services, the VS Code plugin, package management, PowerShell get, the archive module, Platypus. Why is PowerShell any different, right? Well, production scale is different. And PowerShell is something that's been out there for 10 years. It's something that you guys depend on to be stable, performant, uh, secure. And, and that's, that's, uh, that means we can't just wing it, right? Process really matters. And with a lot of those other projects, we sort of, uh, uh, you know, ha use them as a beachhead to sort of understand open source both inside the team and outside the team. Um, but, but really, you know, we had to have these very clear processes uh, from day one. So when we opened up that repo, every question... That, that you guys had needed to have an answer that was written down somewhere. This wasn't something where we could just ad hoc say, you know, oh yeah, well, maybe we'll get back to you on that tomorrow, or, you know, yeah, you probably should have tests for these pull requests, but that's something you should just know. No, everything we did needed to be written down, codified, very clear up front. Right along these lines, contributors needed more guidance, right? So, so we needed a readme.markdown file that really served as sort of Q&A tree that you branch out. You know, you, oh, what are you trying to accomplish? I'm trying to install PowerShell, okay, then, you know, start from here. Or I'm trying to contribute to PowerShell, start from here. Um, and so that was sort of a Q&A tree, and I highly recommend those of you who haven't seen that readme to check it out. It's, it's uh, I think, gotten to a very good place. Um, and the contributing file should be highly actionable. So, you know, if you're contributing to docs, there should be a very clear, you know, step one is this, step five is this, whatever. Um, and then compliance is very serious, right? We, we couldn't, uh, you know, shirk on any of the, the compliance, legal, security stuff. Um, so back to our basic principles, sort of wrapping back around to the uh, ubiquity. Um, so today for PowerShell 6, uh, our main priority is establishing a baseline of functionality that works across all platforms. So I know you guys all have tons of awesome new features that you want to see in PowerShell. Um, unfortunately, a lot of those are going to have to wait until after 6.0 because we want to make sure that all of the platforms are on the same playing field and that we've really gotten Mac OS and Linux to a good place before we start adding things uh, and, and trying to play the catch-up game um, um, for Mac and Linux. Uh, back compat, this, this principle that we had around having a, a cross you know, CLR compatibility, 
um, and really compatibility between Windows PowerShell and PowerShell Core means we can't diverge on the language or fix any of these sort of nagging things that you might want to fix. You know, it's, it's, uh, there was some talk about, you know, oh, maybe we, we change the return semantics. And, and if that's going to break a whole ton of uh, scripts from the past, uh, then, then really we, we can't go and change that in the, in the new version of PowerShell uh, if we want scripts to continue working. Now, formatting and output has always been exempt from the breaking changes uh, definition. Um, so we, you know, we still reserve the right to, to fix a bunch of formatting stuff. Um, interactive stuff as well, tab completion, PS read line. Um, and we wanted to create this great story for, for, for cross-platform module authors. And so you'll see sort of some of the, the SDK bits start to trickle out over the next couple, couple weeks and months. Um, I will say that we have selectively made some small breaking changes where we believe that the, the breakage was very limited. Um, this is a, a query right here um, that goes to a label uh, called breaking change. Um, and you'll see here that we've got some pull requests that have been accepted, tag breaking change. These have all been reviewed by our committee. Um, you'll see this committee review tag right here. Uh, a couple of these are, were denied as issues. Um, what's that? Oh, no! Video stream, there we go. So this is a breaking change label. This red breaking change means uh, you know the committee needed to review these in order to accept them. You'll see some merge PRs. Um, we want to document these uh, going forward, so this is a nice tag for us to go go look at to see what's changed. But but by and large, a lot of these are breaking changes only in, in definition. So uh, you know there's things that are technically breaking changes, but that are highly unlikely to break anyone. So um, if you ever get a chance to take a look there, uh, that's awesome. Sorry, I lost my place here. I will try not to do that again because that's a painful context switch. Um, okay, now community, again, feedback is the primary driver in our prioritization. So as much as we can, as often as we can, we internalize your feedback. Um, RFCs, which I'll get into in a, a few minutes, uh, are essentially just specifications. Um, we try to wait at least a month before we accept these things and, and take a vote on them, and that gives you a chance in the PowerShell RFC repo to give us uh, a bunch of feedback. Um, and our goal, again, is to be as transparent and communicative as possible, right? Everything should be out in the open. How am I doing on time here? It's uh, 58, I'm about halfway through. Okay. Um, so once we shipped, what did we learn, right? So thanks to your feedback, almost overnight, uh, we found out that there were a lot of interactive and usability problems on Mac and Linux. We knew about a lot of these, but we didn't know about a lot more of them. And I think uh, in a very brief period of time, in the first couple alphas, we fixed a ton of bugs related to console host rendering and you know, tab completion, progress bar problems, these sorts of things. We also learned that remoting was clearly important to people. Uh, one of the first things that I think almost everyone did was you know, fire open their MacBook and type enter PS session uh, into a Windows box, uh, which of course, of course you should, right? Um, but so we, we learned very quickly based on the issues being filed there, even a lot of duplicate issues, that this was something that was important to a large set of people. We also learned that the REST and JSON command lines needed work. This was one of our hypotheses that ended up being validated. Uh, you know, a lot of bugs ended up getting filed from people who weren't traditional PowerShell users uh, that were trying to use PowerShell for the first time to interact with REST APIs. And you know, some of the semantics around how we return JSON and these sort of things uh, you know, didn't make a whole lot of sense. We also discovered what didn't have a written answer. Um, so you know, immediately someone said, well, hey, can the community submit RFCs? And we said, yeah, of course. And they, they asked, well, how would I have known that? Uh, and the truth was it wasn't written down anywhere. So we wrote it down. These, these sorts of things are just this very rapid, rapid feedback loop. Uh, we also figured out that, that building portable modules was really difficult. Um, and so unfortunately, this is a story that's, that's changed significantly from .NET Core 1.1 to .NET Core 2.0, but we plan to, to have some, some better documentation and guidance uh, shortly on how you build C-sharp and, and PowerShell core modules that, uh, that work with, with Windows PowerShell. And we also found there's a long tail of problems with building, testing, debugging PowerShell on various platforms. You know, contributors are running into some issues with the SDK or with .NET Core. And so we, we tried to just get these all sorted out and, and improve our documentation. And I think if you go look at the commit history from middle of August, uh, you, you'll see that happening very quickly. So six months later, right, we've got this block of time. We've, we've done all the feedback. We're shipping alphas every three to four weeks. We fixed a lot of the problems that you guys have reported. Where are we at today? What's next? 
Beta 1. So this guy uh, was supposed to actually come out today. Uh, I, I had a, a conversation uh, with the engineering manager, Steve Lee, back in, in Redmond last night. Um, and uh, we decided to postpone this in, until next Tuesday, I believe. Um, and mainly that's around me documenting some things that I need to document and to, uh, build some demos, that sort of thing. Uh, so, but, but this is releasing, uh, yeah, next, next Tuesday, I believe. All this work is being tracked using a milestone tag. So if, uh, for those of you who are sort of more inquisitive, um, you'd have noticed us sort of moving issues in and out of this beta one milestone. And so you could have seen at any time what the sort of ship blockers were uh, uh, for, for beta one. Uh, one of the, the big ones there was the move to .NET Core 2.0. So this is something the .NET team's been working very hard at. Um, it gives us .NET Standard 2.0, which is essentially a, a common set of APIs between the full CLR and the core CLR. Um, and this means that a lot of stuff that did not work in the past is going to magically work. And uh, a lot of stuff that, uh, that, that hasn't worked in the past will work after, after little uh, to medium effort on our part. So, so this is uh, really exciting. Again, all those improvements to REST and JSON command lines we've been making in beta 1. Uh, we fixed a lot of these egregious interactive problems. The progress bar, surprisingly, uh, was a huge problem, not just for, uh, for those of you who like seeing nice, pretty progress output, but it actually caused a lot of performance issues. Uh, so, so we got all those taken care of, thanks to a lot of, a lot of uh, contributions from our community. Uh, we improved the documentation, and uh, you know, the, the potentially controversial one here, uh, we've added telemetry. Um, so I will say right now, uh, this, this went through a, a very extensive uh, RFC feedback process. It's extremely easy to opt out. This is probably not going to be the mechanism for the long term, but for discoverability's sake, uh, we, we went ahead and dropped an empty text file in PS Home called delete me to disable console host telemetry. And if you delete that file, it will disable console host telemetry. Um, today, the telemetry is only two pieces of metadata that we send up when you start PowerShell. Um, that's the git commit ID, so the essentially the, the version of PowerShell that you're running, um, and the OS description. This is, uh, for those of you familiar on, on uh, Linux, this is essentially uh, uname-a, so it's like a, a user agent string basically for, for what operating system you're running. On Windows, this returns Microsoft Windows 10.0. whatever the build number is. Um, so those are the only two pieces of metadata that we send up. I'll give you one second. Uh, and and uh, you know this is just a delete a file and and you are, you're permanently disabled. So, so uh, on Windows, the PS Home for PowerShell Core is uh, program files PowerShell. Yes. Yeah, so the question was on on Windows, PS Home for PowerShell Core is in program files, and that's correct. And and this does not affect, by the way, Windows PowerShell at all. This is only for PowerShell Core. Um, it's it's you know everything is is self contained within that PS Home folder, uh, and the same is true on Linux. So um, you know. You, you just uh, delete this file and, and you're, you're totally opted out. Um, you know, we want to add mechanisms into the installer in the future. Um, any changes that we make to the telemetry in the future, if we ever decide to add any properties, that's all going to go through the RFC review process. It's going to be very transparent. And the plan is also, for those of you who haven't seen it, we have a, a community dashboard built in, in Power BI that has a lot of our community data. And what we actually want to do is plumb this data uh, into that dashboard so that you guys can understand what data we have, how we're using it, whether it's useful, why it's useful. Um, and so all of this we want to be totally out in the open. This is it's using uh, something called Application Insights. Uh, we've got extensive documentation in the README on how this all works. Uh, and, and you can go there to see how you know, your IPs get anonymized and everything gets hashed. And, and it's uh, you know, very safe and secure. I'm, I'm a privacy nut personally, um, and so I, I take this very seriously. Any more questions there? We're good. Okay. So now the fun stuff. .NET Standard 2.0. This thing is magic. It is black magic that I, I do not fully understand from an implementation standpoint, but from a user standpoint, uh, as as you know, the PowerShell team is, we can't be more excited about this thing. Um, there's some great starter content from the the, the PM on that project, Emo Landworth. Um, he's got stuff on YouTube, on the .NET blog, and on GitHub. Uh, depending on how you guys learn, whether you want to read a doc, watch a video, um, explaining how this all works. Um, but the goal here, again, ubiquity. Make as many existing Windows PowerShell modules and scripts as possible work in PowerShell Core. Um, this includes first-party modules, third-party modules. Uh, you know, All of these we want to, to just work. 
So what Dynast Standard 2.0 promises to do is bring in almost with an asterisk here. They say 99% with an asterisk of the .NET Framework 4. I said 4.6.1 here. I'm realizing that's a typo. It's 4.5.1 APIs um, into .NET Core 2.0. Um, so essentially, they've they've built these these shim DLLs so that uh, if you're using you know doing an add type for a, a, a .NET type that that was in 4.5.1, it will forward it to the appropriate API in .NET Core 2.0 with um, just magic under the covers. Um, the real magic under the covers here is that this is uh, uh, what's called IL compatible. So in the past, .NET Standard 1.6 um, which was .NET Core 1.1 and .NET Framework 4.5.1, those two, uh, you, you had to do a recompile if you wanted to be compatible with both of them simultaneously. So the module author or the DLL author would actually have to target <coughs> .NET Standard 1.6 in their project uh, to, to, to build this universal DLL. With .NET Standard 2.0, any DLL that only uses the .NET Standard 2.0 APIs can just be loaded into a core 2.0 runtime without recompilation. And so what this means is that uh, for, for a lot of DLLs that exist in down-level versions of Windows, for instance, we don't have to go back to those teams uh, to get them to recompile their, their DLLs in order to load them into PowerShell Core. And so this is uh, an exercise that we're going through right now, essentially validating to what extent those down-level DLLs only use net standard 2.0 APIs. And so what modules can we guarantee uh, on older versions of Windows? Because by the way, PowerShell Core is down level to Windows 7. Um, you know, which of those modules are, are going to, to be able to be loaded in PowerShell Core? Uh, just to be clear, what's the difference between .NET standard 2.0 and .NET Core 2.0? Very good question. So the question is, uh, what's the difference between .NET standard 2.0 and .NET Core 2.0? .NET Core 2.0 is the runtime that implements .NET standard 2.0. .NET Standard 2.0, you can just think of as the API definition. In, a, in a, a native C or C++ world, it's almost like a header file. In C Sharp, the, you know, it's, it's a platform target. So you just say, you know, I'm, I'm targeting this API. At compile time, that will guarantee that you're not using any APIs that don't exist in Standard 2.0. But, but the runtime that you load that compiled DLL into can be either .NET Framework or .NET Core 2.0. And so, so ultimately, PowerShell Core is using Core 2.0, but it allows us to take advantage of a standard 2.0 compliant DLL. Does that make sense? There's a lot of nuance here. I, it's, uh, I've been getting questions all, all week about this, I know, so it's, uh, a lot of people are interested. I, I posted up here at the top, this is one of my favorite things uh, about the switch to .NET Core 2.0. Um, this is the line number change that happened in the pull request uh, to Core 2.0. You'll notice we added 765 lines but over 3,700 lines were deleted. And that was because of APIs where we had to work around the lack of API in .NET Core, and we could, we could delete that, that if def or that compile path uh, change between full CLR and, and core CLR and move back to common code. And so this is, this is gonna be happening more and more over time. We're actually gonna be trimming the code base to make less differences between full CLR and core CLR, which is really exciting. Like I said, today we're validating this compatibility with, with Windows PowerShell modules. We're also pulling in like everything that's on the gallery, every script we can find out there that uses add type, and we're gonna do some analysis to try to figure out what level of compatibility we had. Uh, to give you a quick number, the .NET Core team did some analysis with the DLLs on, on uh, NuGet.org, and of every DLL out there, uh, over two thirds of them were, were .NET Standard 2.0 compliant. So a ton of DLLs are just gonna work uh, assuming that, that all those APIs are the same under the hood. There's still this GAC problem, which is essentially from PowerShell. How do we go and find these full CLR DLLs? Um, in the .NET framework, we have the GAC, the Global Assembly Cache. This basically says, uh, hey, when I do an add type uh, or, or a required assembly in my module manifest, if I don't specify a path, how do I go and find that DLL? It's essentially a global registry of all the DLLs in the machine. .NET Core does not have a GAC. Everything is file-based. Uh, and so from .NET Core, we need to figure out what heuristics we want to use uh, to go and look for all those assemblies. You know, when I type import module Hyper-V, how do I go find the underlying uh, dependencies for the Hyper-V module on the machine? And so that's a, that's a problem that we, we haven't completely solved yet. We've got some ideas, but um, you know, we're working through it right now. We're also formulating these, uh, what, what we're very tentatively calling PowerShell standard scaffolding assemblies. 
Um, this is essentially the same thing as .NET Standard, but for PowerShell's APIs. So for those of you that build C Sharp commandlets uh, for PowerShell, um, essentially you would bring in this, this assembly instead of the, the, the PowerShell 5 or PowerShell 6 assemblies, and if you, you use this to implement your commandlets, it'll guarantee uh, that your commandlets will work from, from PowerShell 3.0 to 6.0. So today this is a very scoped uh, API surface area, and that's because we want everything in that DLL to work perfectly with 6.0, and in the future we may follow the same path as .NET Standard, where we, we sort of build uh, a larger and larger set that works with future versions of PowerShell Core uh, that, that implement uh, older uh, functionality in Windows PowerShell. So, so definitely give us feedback on this guy. I'm, I'm putting these slides up, by the way, all these hyperlinks, you'll be able to find them. Uh, okay, am I, am I off at 15 or at 30? 30, 30. excellent, <laughs> good, good. Okay, um, so, uh, so yeah, check this thing out. We're, we're trimming that down as, as time goes on. Um, and, and again, all of this is sort of subject to change up until RTM time because we do wanna make sure that we nail that API surface area. So what about after that? Beta one's coming out this week, you know, What's going to happen to the release process? Uh, you know, what's what's coming next? What are what are the other ship blockers uh, for for PowerShell Core? Um, so first of all, we're going to continue to ship on this cadence of every three or four weeks, uh, as we have been. And so the betas, you'll just that's why I say beta.x here. Those are just going to keep going up two, three, four, five up until we hit uh, sort of like a release candidate or, or something, uh, you know, in between GA and beta. Um, but a top priority, and and each of these, by the way, click through to. Uh, a PowerShell project or a GitHub project, excuse me. Um, I have to do that again. I, this context switch is actually worth it. Um, so, so this is sort of how we're prioritizing today uh, uh, these, these different buckets of issues. So you'll see here there's this projects tab at the top. You navigate through to that and you'll see, you know, Linux, Mac usability. So these are issues that, uh, you know, impact how you use uh, PowerShell in a cross-platform way. So, you know, the differences in file encodings between platforms, line endings, path delimiters, uh, case sensitivity, uh, permissions, integration with other shells, all of these things, you know, we need to make sure that we have a story for how to do them universally. Um, and they're, they're really hard problems because, uh, you know, changing uh, some of these things requires changing stuff on Windows. Uh, which, as we said, is something we don't want to do because we don't want to break the old existing scripts. Um, and so today, the path that we're following is sort of to have different defaults on different platforms. Um, so, you know, for instance, uh, PS Readline uh, defaults to Emacs mode on uh, Linux and Mac platforms, and it defaults to Windows mode on Windows platforms. Um, and, and so this is something that's configurable, but what we'd like to do is expose sort of a universal mechanism for changing all of the platform defaults for these things, file encodings and you know, path delimiter preferences and, and all these, so that you can, you can almost switch into a mode of sorts uh, you know, at the top of a script to say, hey, this script was written with the Linux defaults in mind, so switch the Windows machine over to those Linux defaults uh, to take care of those things. And you'll, you know, you'll see here we've got, we need to figure out a way to bring back the, the legacy Windows aliases. We removed all of the LS and CP and, and all of those um, from from uh, uh, the Linux platforms, so how do I bring those back if I absolutely want to use aliases in my scripts? Um, how do we, uh, you know, deal with uh, this? Is from Alexander the the difference in case sensitivity for environment variables uh, in Linux? Uh, env lowercase path is not the same as env uppercase path, and so how do we normalize that? Uh, you know, problems with symlinks or uh, you know trailing slashes, these sorts of things. So. So, you know, you can come in here and, and, and sort of in that mindset, you know, feel free to file issues there and you'll see them show up in this project. Um, another one we've got here, uh, I'm not going to go back into presentation mode just yet, but the, the developer experience, so as we talked about, um, you know, having this, this portable scaffolding module, making sure that we have great documentation for how to host PowerShell in your own application, um, making sure that we have script analyzer rules that will, you know, give you some guidance if you're using commandlets that, that don't exist in PowerShell core and, and what you might do to work around that fact. Um, these are all things we, we want to make sure we take care of. Uh, and remoting. So we've got two projects here. Uh, one of these is remoting over OpenSSH. Uh, one of them is remoting over WSMAN. These are both scenarios that we want to make sure we fulfill because we know, you know, going from a MacBook 
uh, to your legacy Windows servers is something that's very important. Um, and going from uh, you know your your new Windows 10 box running uh, OpenSSH, hopefully at some point here in the future, uh, you know connecting to to a Linux box uh, or a Mac box running running PowerShell is also very important. Um, I will say right now we're running into some really really tough challenges uh, around Mac's uh, actual removal of support uh, in the OS for NTLM. Um, this is making uh, NTLM authentication really tricky. We've got it on Linux. Uh, Apple explicitly removed NTLM APIs uh, from from their their crypto libraries. So um, it's you know we're, we're looking into that, and, and I encourage you guys to really be vocal if if that's an important priority for you uh, to do NTLM authentication from a MacBook. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think that uh, yeah, I mean PowerShell team revision? Of, uh, do you think that the people will actually use PowerShell to manage? Linux boxes, or the most important scenario is actually moving that will enable us to go from one platform to another. Right. So the question is, um, do you believe that that uh, in the PowerShell team's view, and it's a great question. PowerShell team's view, uh, you know, do we think that people are going to use Linux, uh, a PowerShell, to actually manage Linux servers, um, or are they just going to be using PowerShell as sort of a remoting client or a developer tool? Uh, you know, to, to manage Windows boxes or to manage cloud instances. And uh, the truth is, I think both are going to happen. Um, I, I've already seen on this trip a number of people, actually more than I expected, that are already trying to manage Linux servers uh, using PowerShell. Um, internally, we've had some interest around using PowerShell uh, to set up CI servers and do, do build infrastructures uh, with, with PowerShell on Linux machines and to sort of uh, you know, do or overall orchestration. Um, so while you, you, we really want to have high interoperability with existing configuration and 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 uh, uh, you know automation artifacts on Linux. You know, so so it may be that I use PowerShell to, uh, to sort of call into some Python scripts or call into some Ruby scripts. Um, you know, so there's a number of possibilities. But but we also want to enable as like like Bartek had some really cool commandlets uh, for the uh, uh, you know actually managing Linux users. Uh, on, on a local instance, and so that's something you know that we want to enable as well. But but today, the most common thing that I see is people using PowerShell as as a REST client and an orchestration engine for the cloud um, and and for for Windows servers. Um, but I think that that can change over time as PowerShell becomes more and more mature on Linux platforms. So um, it's really something that you know our minds are open to everything, um, and, and we'll we'll pivot you know in, in the direction where we we see the most interest over time. But I think I think some of these questions will get more better answered as as we mature as a platform. Do you have any data how many of the Linux users are adopting the PowerShell core as of now? Uh, we have some download numbers. Um, we're we're sitting at over uh, I want to say like six hundred thousand downloads for Ubuntu based platforms. Um, four or five hundred thousand downloads for OS ten. Um, unfortunately, download numbers are, are kind of misleading um, because it really doesn't tell you, you know, how often people are running these instances, uh, you know, whether they're they're downloading them in their CI systems over and over again, or whether they're, you know, uh, uh, really manually downloading these things. Um, and this is why we, we had to implement telemetry. And I think after you see the beta one come out, we really want to take advantage of of sort of the wave of publicity from from Build and .NET Core 2.0. And, and our beta, uh, you know, to, to find out how many people are really using this out in the wild. Um, but yeah, we, we do, I, I encourage you to check out the, the Power BI community dashboard that we have. Uh, you can find through our blog um, because it does have all those download numbers and a nice easy uh, uh, dashboard to, to check out. And the telemetry will be showing up there as well. So as I said, stay tuned at, uh, at GitHub uh, PowerShell PowerShell projects. This is where we're doing that project tracking um, and, and you'll see stuff sort of get added there uh, over time. All right, so now the not so fun stuff. So we've got all these things that uh, you know are going into PowerShell 6. What's getting left behind, right? What do we not currently have plans to bring into PowerShell? There's obviously a desire for everything to work in the new world, but but ultimately we, we can't bring everything forward. There are technologies that uh, you know are, are very outdated and, and difficult to, to use in a core CLR world. Um, and so today, um, obviously we, we've talked about this already. We, we don't have any plans to bring uh, to, to create a .NET full CLR version of PowerShell 6. Um, obviously, this is, this is subject to change, and I'll say all of these things are subject to change based on user feedback. Um, but, but today, uh, given the, the high promise compatibility of .NET Standard 2.0, uh, 
uh, you know, providing a ramp into the PowerShell core world, we really want to, to sort of get people on, on the new and fresh and, and you know, move them over to, to a modern core CLR world. Um, that's not to say, as I, I talked about yesterday, that uh, Windows PowerShell is going away. Windows PowerShell is the de facto version of PowerShell that ships in Windows. Um, and we will continue to, to service it and support it as we would any other uh, Microsoft product. I think in, in the long term, you'll see it sort of going the way of, of uh, a PowerShell version 2. Uh, I don't think that it will become an optional component anytime soon. Um, you know, it's going to be there in, in the base or default installation of Windows for a long time. Um, and you may actually, you know, see some, some functionality improvements at some point. Uh, for instance, the, the SSH-based remoting is something I really want to put uh, into Windows PowerShell to make sure that we have good interoperability with PowerShell Core. Um, but ultimately, the new language features, uh, all the shiny new commandlets, new parameters, and that sort of thing are, are going to exist uh, solely in, in PowerShell Core. Is your question to know if we will have side-by-side -side installation forever uh, of the PowerShell Core? Um, so the question is, will we have side-by-side -side installation forever of PowerShell Core? I don't know the answer to that question. I think it very much depends on how the, the Core CLR ecosystem progresses over time. Um, today, it's a side-by-side -side installation. I don't think there's ever a time where, where we'll want to replace Windows PowerShell with PowerShell Core in the box. Um, you know, it's very easy today you know, to, to install PowerShell Core. It's, it's an MSI or a zip on Windows. You, you just you know, either install this thing to program files or you unzip a zip and you double click PowerShell.exe and these two PowerShells do not interact with each other at all. Um, and so you can be very, very sure when you install PowerShell um, and, and this is the reason that we wouldn't replace, I think, Windows PowerShell is because you want to be absolutely positive when you install PowerShell Core that no changes in the Core CLR or in PowerShell 6 are going to ex affect your existing workloads or scripts. Um, this is something that I know scares a lot of people with, with WMFs is, you know, it's kind of all or nothing. If I go from, from PowerShell 4 to PowerShell 5, I have to replace PowerShell 4. And that means that if there was some change that breaks my scripts, I don't really have an opt-out path except to do an uninstall and a reboot and roll back and, and you know, it's very, very painful, especially when you guys have limited maintenance windows. And so, uh, you know, this is uh, something that we really, well, these guys are laughing at limited maintenance windows. I know, they're, it's not awesome. Um, but so this was, you know, side by side was an extremely important principle in early days of PowerShell 6 because it, it just had to be that, that you could install N of these side by side. And what's, what's awesome is you can actually install N versions of PowerShell 6 side by side. Um, and so, you know, in, in the future with a 6.0 or a 7.0 and 8.0, these can all exist on the same machine. And that's actually what, what I'm asking because I would love to have the opportunity in the future to have like 6 and 7 and 8 on the same box and just be able to test it on the same box, for example? Yeah, so you're saying we'd love the opportunity to have six, seven, and eight all in the same box and be able to test them all independently. And, and yeah, that's, that's totally something that's going to be possible. So, you know, it'll, it'll also make, make module testing and, and authoring a lot easier for you guys, right? To be able to, to just target each version of PowerShell, try it out uh, on the same boxes. So that's really, really important principle that, that we made sure to nail. Yeah, so PowerShell program files, PowerShell, and then six zero seven zero eight zero kind of thing. Right. So the question is, how do you sort of manage, uh, you know, not just the installation. So in you know in program files, we have a six zero seven zero eight zero, and that is how we do the installations of the alphas today. For those of you that install the alphas, I know it can get annoying because we do these releases so often. But you have an alpha fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, all on the same machine. Um, and, and you've got to uninstall those each, but also does that mean you have uh, your own PS module paths, your own profiles for each of these installations? Um, I'm, I'm not sure that we've solved the profile problem yet, um, but I think the PS module path uh, problem has been solved and that, that in your, uh, you know, ENV user data, uh, or, or um, I don't know, the, 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 the user profile uh, pro PS module path, that thing uh, has its own version subfolder. Um, there's a, a Program files, I think the, the modules folder for program files is in PS Home. Um, and so I think that that's its own PS module path. Um, but you would have to, as a user, you know, explicitly add another PS module path uh, onto the machine. And of course, that's because we can't guarantee compatibility between, you know, something that's a 7.0 only module, uh, you know, and, and we don't want to automatically have that show up in 6.0. The question that I got yesterday from someone was, uh, does this mean that the full uh, 
or the function of the on the full dot net framework will stay at the number five as the major number. Yeah, so the question is, will, will be five, one, five, two, five, three, yeah. So the question is, will, will Windows PowerShell uh, stay at five dot x? Will future versions of Windows PowerShell be, you know, if we introduce a new functionality, it will be five two, five three, five four? And the answer is yes. So, so you'll see, you know, this is sort of a, a divergence here um, in, in the two branches, um, not necessarily in functionality, but but in in terms of versioning. So, so full CLR, very similar to .NET Framework, is now four dot seven, I think, GA yesterday. So. Um, you know, this is uh, how, how things will go in the future. All right, so, so now we've also got uh, snap-in support. We're not taking forward, hopefully, uh, you know, I know, bummer. Uh, workflow, workflow support is currently not planned, and this is because the underlying workflow engine uh, is not supported in .NET Core today. Um, and then the WMI v1 commandlets, so these are get WMI object, invoke WMI method. Um, this, the WMI v2 commandlets do work on Windows today. They do not work on Linux. Uh, we're investigating that. Please let us know if that's a priority for you. Um, but, yeah, okay, so, uh, so excuse me. So the WMI v2 is, is essentially the sim commandlets. So this is, you know, get some instance. Um, as I said, they're not there on Linux today. They are there on Windows for core. Um, but but we'll, we'll hopefully be adding them in the future, and that'll be prioritized based on how many people are asking for those. I, yes. Now, of course, you know, the caveat here is that given the right scenario, demand, technological need, nothing is ever out of the question forever, right? Every, it's just code. Everything is possible. Uh, but, you know, this is just a, a sort of relative prioritization based on where we're at right now. Do you have some kind of list of the commanders that you're not taking into account as a shipping to the... So the question... Because now I see, okay, these are missing, but it's bad to have them. Some are missing because you don't plan to have them, so it would be nice to have just a list of commanders like on the core, obviously, because not, I don't care about that. I totally agree. Uh, the, the question is, can we have a list of commandlets that not just that work and don't work on various platforms or, or core versus full, but also what we plan to work and what we uh, you know, do not plan to work. Um, today there's a known issues document in the, the GitHub repository that has a number of these listed. Um, I will say that it's incomplete and, and we definitely have some documentation debt there um, and, and by nature of how quickly we've been moving, uh, you know, the documentation really needs to, to work its way into the general workflow um, and, and that's, uh, that's happening here around the beta milestone timeframe because uh, we've, we now have a 6.0 documentation set that, that's spinning up and, and that's, that's starting to happen. So, um, yeah, we, we totally should do that. And we'd, we'd ultimately like to have script analyzer rules that, that you know, codify that list as well. So. Do you plan to support GIA on SSH remoting? Uh, question is, do we plan to support GIA on SSH remoting? Uh, I don't think that anyone's working on that right now. I don't say that we're not planning that. Um, I, I think that, that we definitely have a desire to do that. To, today, that, that's true. There would have to be some changes in, in either GIA or in remoting in order to support that. Um, and and uh, nobody's actively working, looking into that work today, but, but it's definitely something that, that many people on the team have a desire to do in the long term. All right, so you've got feedback. Now what? All right, we've got two minutes, so we're going really quick here. First of all, use PowerShell Core. Install instructions are in the README. It's really easy. Every single platform has its own install instructions, packages, different ways to do it. Um, File issues. There's an issue template. Please use it. Uh, it's really easy. It's like, what did you expect? What happened? Like, you know, what's your version? And steps to repro or something. It's very, very easy. Um, it shows up automatically when you hit new issue. Uh, give feedback on existing RFCs. So as I said, unfortunately I can't go in more depth here, but an RFC is just a big design document. You can submit these yourselves as well. Um, usually there's sort of an implicit guarantee that uh, you know, you'll implement the RFC if you, if you do the RFC, but uh, you know, it's not necessarily the case. Um, and contribute code and docs, right? So we've got a pull request lifecycle here. We've got great docs on you know, if you're a newbie to Git and GitHub, how to get started, you know, how, to, how to give us contributions. Um, start with these up for grabs issues. So we have a label here uh, that are all the sort of uh, things that we've validated uh, we would take if someone did them, but that we're not prioritizing right now. So, um, you know, th those are, are great place to start. Um, so I want to open the floor for questions. Unfortunately, I, I had some bonus round demos I wanted to highlight, uh, you know, some of the work that you guys in the front have been doing here, Power Code and Alexander and, and uh, you know, uh, there's a bunch of others, but unfortunately, I, I don't think I had, I, I, uh, maybe I did have one for you, Barthage. I don't remember. But, uh, but I do want to open the floor for questions because we've got one more minute here. And, and uh, yeah, go ahead. Maybe on your 
Are they on the GitHub as well? Yeah, so there's a, um, a separate repo uh, called PowerShell RFC. Um, and we, we just switched over to a, a new model for giving feedback on those, um, which is to actually give feedback in the pull request. Um, and so you'll hear, you know, here's a, a new native command exit error. Somebody, somebody filed an RFC. And you can just sort of go into this files changed and, and add a line, you know, if you want to give feedback right here, uh, you know, I like this or whatever, um, you know, you, you can do that. So um, there's a, a whole directory full of the, the drafts we have, the ones that are experimental where we've accepted the RFC and we've begun implementing it. Um, we've got ones that are final, which means they've been implemented uh, and, and, and closed. Um, so, you know, definitely come, come and check those out because there's a, a bunch of new designs that, that uh, we'd love to get feedback on. Yeah. You mentioned Nano. How does Nano get to six? How does Nano get to six? So this is something we're we're still working through right now. Um, Nano is very interesting because uh, it, it's both a a, a host and a, a container guest. Um, and so today um, we're really trying to push the the idea that PowerShell is sort of an application for Nano in the very similar way that, that Python would be an application for Nano or Ruby. And so the best way for us to, to really iterate on, on PowerShell very quickly in a Nano world is to ha uh, update our Docker file that forks from the Nano server image to, to install PowerShell 6. Today that means PowerShell 6 is getting installed side by side um, with, with PowerShell 5.1 in that Nano image. Um, in the future it may be that uh, you know, there is no PowerShell 5.1 in that image and that we're just injecting PowerShell 6 into it. And so you'll see on the, on the Docker Hub, um, we've got a, uh, and, and by the way, oh, that's not right. Uh, we've got a number of, of uh, different container images here and one of those is nano server. So, so this means that, you know, if you pick up this, this nano server image, it's got PowerShell 6 on it, and we continue to update this uh, whenever we do releases of PowerShell 6. Yep? By, by going open source, uh, do you expect uh, PowerShell to, 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 to branch out in, in more distributions? So the, possible? Yeah, so the question is, do you, do you expect, uh, the fact that we're open source, do you expect PowerShell to branch out into more distributions or possibly forks of the project? Uh, it's a great question. I certainly wouldn't rule it out. Um, you know, if, uh, like, like we haven't heard anything from anybody, but if, you know, vendor X said, oh, we want our own custom build of PowerShell that's got, you know, this feature that you weren't willing to take in, into the core PowerShell engine or, or with this breaking change that you weren't willing to take, um, you know, we certainly could see that. But I think is, uh, you know, if you look at a lot of these communities where those big schisms happen, uh, uh, Node.js was a really big one uh, that was in the, the public eye for a, a year ago. Um, it ends up being kind of detrimental to the ecosystem because you don't have these universal modules and scripts that everyone can depend on. And you saw with the, the Node uh, situation that they ultimately uh, uh, merged back together. Um, and so, you know, I would hope that we're being collaborative and transparent and communicative enough um, that, that people don't feel the need to fork PowerShell. But, uh, you know, anybody can do that. And that's, that's uh, certainly their own prerogative. And, and I, you know, I think that that's... Uh, that's part of the joy of open source is that these sorts of things are possible. Yeah. As your automation, I saw you kill up uh, workflows. Yeah. Uh, so the question is with Azure Automation, what's what's the story there? Yeah, will that continue to be Windows PowerShell? <laughs> yeah, so I don't think that we've closed on what's happening to workflows or, or run books inside of Azure Automation. Um, uh, you know, Azure Automation today does support scripts, DSC configurations, these are all things that we do want to support and do support with PowerShell Core. And so Azure Automation certainly can, can target Linux and Mac instances using PowerShell Core. Um, but I think that those runbooks, uh, you know, what, what I think Azure Automation found was that when they added script support, uh, a ton of those runbooks were simply scripts uh, wrapped in a workflow so that they could run on Azure Automation. Um, and, and, you know, the other reason that people use workflows is for parallelism. Um, and I think the community's clearly shown that there's enough demand for parallelism with all of the community modules that you guys have done, that that's something we want to do post 6.0. So parallelism is super important. And I, I think if we knock those two things out, that uh, I don't think workflow support is going to really be necessary in the future. Yeah. No, no problem at all. I really appreciate it, guys. I'm going to be right outside the room. If you have any more questions, for me, you can talk to me. Thank you.
Thank you, I appreciate it, man. Thank you for doing that. Uh, I assume if you send that to her, that uh, you know, I hope I didn't just slam your battery totally, but uh, yeah, probably.